But anyway. Okay, now, Acts 1, 9 to 11. Acts 1, 9 to 11. Let's read, guys. Now, focus in Jesus' name. Focus. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Our Lord Jesus Christ was taken up. Pay attention. Our Lord Jesus Christ was taken up in full view of the apostles <clears throat> 40 days after his physical resurrection. This is 40 days after his physical resurrection, if you read Acts 1, starting at verse 1. Focus now. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Right? Now let read verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. I'm repeating again so that you catch it. But let me go back to 9. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So physically he went up into a cloud and disappeared, took off with the cloud. Now let's go to 11. Pay attention, 11, and then 12. 11 and 12. Guys, I need you to focus in Jesus' name. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So this same Jesus that you saw physically taken up into a cloud and disappeared, he's going to come back in the same manner. Only difference is he ascended this time. He's going to descend the second time. Now, verse 12, notice where Jesus left from, the place that Jesus physically ascended. Notice verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now, did everyone get the point? Jesus physically was taken up from the Mount of Olives, entered a cloud, and disappeared in the cloud. The angels say the way he left is the way he'll come back. So that means one day a cloud will appear, and then Jesus physically will come down from the cloud and descend where? To the Mount of Olives, right? Right? Are you getting it so far? Okay. Now, why do I say physically? Because according to the Bible, Jesus has a physical body of flesh and bones. When God raised the body on the third day, it was Jesus' physical body that had been crucified, that died, that now is made immortal, indestructible. Let me prove that to you. Luke 24, 39 the same author who wrote Acts wrote Luke, Luke 24, 39. Focus, don't ask questions, focus. Luke 24, 39. Focus. Jesus appearing to them that first Easter Sunday. Notice what he says to them. Behold my hands and my feet. Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye See me have. So Jesus is saying, look, I have a body of flesh and bones. I'm not just a spirit. Those spirits have a shape and form, a spiritual body. It's not a body of flesh and bones. That's unique to creatures of the earth. Creatures of the earth have bodies of flesh and bone. Since Jesus became human, took on the nature of a human being, took on a created nature, he added the nature of humanity to himself. In respect to his human nature, he has a physical body of flesh and bones that he raised, immortal, indestructible. Right? Did you read that? Did you get it? Yes. Jesus will return in a body of flesh and bone, not as a spirit. Now, let's look at Acts 2, 29 to 32 for further proof. We'll read 33 as well. Acts 2, 29, 32. Here, Peter quotes a Psalm of David to prove that David the prophet, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, saw the resurrection of Jesus and then prophesied about his resurrection. Read with me, please. Please, you got to get it. If you're not getting it, say, I'm not getting it. Acts 2, 29, 32. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. He's been dead. He's been buried. God didn't raise him to life. 
And his sep sepulchre, his tomb, is with us unto this day. His tomb is still here with his remains. But now notice verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, he was a prophet who received revelation from the Holy Spirit, and God promised him that at the fruit of his loins, from his own physical line, a physical descendant of his, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So God promised David, I'm going to raise up the Christ from your physical flesh, from your physical line. He'll be a physical descendant of you. Now watch 31. And he's seeing this. Not only did God tell him, but God by the Spirit showed him in advance. Seeing this in advance, right? Spake of the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul, Christ's soul, was not left in hell. Hades, neither his flesh, neither the flesh of Christ saw corruption. Here, Peter's saying, God showed David and promised David the Messiah would be a physical descendant of his, which means he'd be truly human, and that God would not allow the flesh body, the physical body of Christ, to, to decay, to see corruption. How did God prevent the physical flesh body of Christ, of Jesus, prevent it from corrupting? Verse 32 tells you, This Jesus, Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Okay. Let's now unpack it. You see what Peter is telling the Jews. God swore to David the Christ would be a physical descendant of his. Right? He would come from David's line physically. So Christ would be a human being. And God swore to David that the physical flesh body of Christ would never corrupt. Though he would die... His flesh body would not see corruption. And how did God preserve the flesh body of Christ from corrupting? By raising that body of flesh to life on the third day, making his body of flesh immortal, indestructible. And then Peter says, we are the witnesses that saw the Christ Raised physically in his body of flesh. We saw that body of flesh. We touched that body of flesh. And we are witnesses. Jesus is alive in his body of flesh. Did you get it? Before I move on? I hope you get it. Because last time we spent an hour. And then I deleted the video because we weren't getting it. So this should prepare you to understand much more. Clear? Yes, they say medically a body starts decomposing on the fourth day, Jonathan. That's what they say, but I'm no medical doctor, but I've heard that. So then let me ask you the question. You have just seen proof. This is how I'm going to know that you're paying attention, you're understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've just seen proof that Jesus was raised in that physical body of flesh and bones. And that body of flesh has now been made immortal, indestructible. Jesus' physical body cannot die, cannot be destroyed anymore. Right? Okay. So when the disciples saw Jesus taken up from the Mount of Olives, they saw with their eyes. That's why they were looking intently. They were, they were not looking like, they were like this. They were shocked and in awe. We have never seen a physical body ascend, enter a cloud, and disappear. They were blown away. So this isn't this proof that they saw Jesus in a physical body that had hands and feet, physical hands and feet. They saw a body of flesh enter a cloud and disappear, right? He's infinitely good. It is amazing. It should blow your minds away. Right? Okay. So when the angel said the way he left is the way he will come, if he left physically in a cloud, that means one day a cloud will appear and a physical body will come down. Now, if he left the Mount of Olives, when Jesus descends out of the cloud, 
in that physical body, his physical body will land where? Where will his physical body land? Where would his physical body land? Acts 112. One more time. You got it. Every one of you got it. Where's the same place, though? You guys got it. Mount of Olives. But let's look at Acts 112 because now you're going to receive proof that according to Acts, Jesus is Jehovah God, the God of Zechariah. Pay attention to verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Jesus left physically the Mount of Olives, will return physically the Mount of Olives. Now here is proof that Luke just portrayed Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Let's go to Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Get ready to be blown away. Many of you already know this from previous sessions, but now read Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Get ready to be blown away. Read, guys. You guys really got to pay attention to verses 3 to 5. Behold, the day of Jehovah is good. I'm sorry, is coming. Sorry, where did I get good? Because repetition, he said, is good. Jehovah, the day of Jehovah, the Lord is coming, cometh. Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses rifled, destroyed, plundered. The woman ravished, these evil, wicked sinners will ravish women, rape them, right? <clears throat> and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the remainder of the people, the residue of the people, shall not be cut off from the city. A remnant will remain in the city, Jerusalem. Now pay attention. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Then Jehovah will come down when the nations gather against Jerusalem. That's when you know. Jehovah's coming. When the armies of the nations gather against Jerusalem, be prepared for Jehovah to come down. That's the sign for us believers. Jehovah's coming down. The armies have gathered against Jerusalem. They're about to destroy it. Jehovah's coming down. Come down. Okay, that's what it's saying here. Now, but pay attention to verse 4. I'm going to read 3 again. Then Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon a Mount of Olives. What place? Mount of Olives. Whose feet? Jehovah's feet. So Zechariah sees his God Jehovah with feet. And he says, the feet of Jehovah will stand on the Mount of Olives and do what to the Mount? Which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, torn in half in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And therefore shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now pay attention to five. Five. And ye shall flee to the valley of mountains. For the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Pay attention to the last part. And Jehovah my God shall come. Not a creature. My God, Jehovah himself, is coming, and all the saints with thee. Now, guys, let's look at four one more time. Azul is the name of the place, Nate. Please, Nate, I know you love the Lord. For the love of Christ, don't get distracted by these place names. Whether you know what Azul is or not, Whether you know what Azal is or not, how's that going to help you see the connection with Jesus? Right? Don't let your mind be distracted by Uzziah, the name of the king, or Azal. Who cares? Focus on 14 and 5 again. Notice 14. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, and the mount will be cleaved in half. Now, folks... Zechariah is saying the Mount of Olives will be physically torn in half, literally and physically. And what causes the Mount to be split in half? Jehovah's feet touching it. This proves that Jehovah's feet are literal physical feet because the Mount will be literally physically split in half by the feet of Jehovah touching it. 
Well, if the mount will be physically split in half, and it's not simply allegorical, that means the cause of, the, of it being split is also physical and literal. What's the cause of it being split? Jehovah's feet landing on it. So just as the mount being split in half is literal physical, the cause of it split, Jehovah's feet touching it, must be literal and physical. So Zechariah sees Jehovah with actual physical feet landing on top of the Mount of Olives. Yes, there are people who doubt this and explain it away, specifically anti-Trinitarians and rabbinic Jews. Okay. Did you guys catch it? Whose physical feet will land on the Mount of Olives according to the prophet Zechariah? Zechariah, don't quote to me New Testament. Don't get me upset again. Whose physical feet will physically touch the Mount of Olives, causing it to physically split according to Zechariah 14? You got it, Jehovah God. But no, folks. Acts 1, 9 to 12 says, that's Jesus. Acts 1, 9 to 12 said, Jesus physically left the Mount of Olives and will physically land upon the Mount of Olives when he comes. Zechariah said it's Jehovah. Acts 1 says it's Jesus. What? Did you guys catch it? Did you guys catch it? You see what I was trying to prove last session, but the distractions were too much? Jehovah's physical feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he comes to destroy the armies of the nations that attack the remnant of the Jews to save them. Acts 1, 9 to 12 says, Jesus left the Mount of Olives physically and will come back to the Mount of Olives physically. So it's his blessed feet that split it in half. You understand what you just read? I don't think it sunk in. You know what you just read? You just read Zechariah beholding Jesus' physical feet and seeing Jesus in his physical body descending to the Mount of Olives, which means Zechariah was allowed to see by the Holy Spirit Jesus Christ return in his second coming in his post-resurrected glorified physical body. That's what Zechariah saw. But then you saw Zechariah call Jesus Jehovah his God. He called Jesus Jehovah my God. Is it sinking in? But then Zechariah says he will come with his saints, his only ones. Verse 5, Zechariah 14, verse 5, the last part. Watch here, Zechariah 14, verse 5, <clears throat> the last part. Read the last part. And Jehovah, my God, he was a Christian because he believed in Jesus. They all were, Alex Gaskin. Not in a sense, they were. And Jehovah, my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. Jehovah, my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. But wait, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 3.13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. When Jesus comes, who does he come with? Who does he come with? To the end, he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Wait, 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 Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming with all his saints. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming with all his saints. Yes. But Zechariah says, Jehovah, his God is coming with all his saints. But wait, let's go to Luke 9, 26. 
Luke 9, 26. The same author who wrote Acts wrote Luke. What did Jesus say? When he comes, he'll come in the glory of who? Luke 9, 26. Yes, you can decimate Joe's witnesses with Zechariah 14 and Acts and 1 Thessalonians. Luke 9, 26. For whosoever, Jesus speaking, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. So wait, Luke, you're telling me Jesus Christ, our Lord, will come to the Mount of Olives and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives, but he's not coming alone. He's coming with his holy ones, the angels. Yes. But wait, Luke, Zechariah says it's Jehovah, Zechariah's God, who's coming with his saints to the Mount of Olives and it's Jehovah's feet that touches the Mount of Olives and splits it in half. Yeah. What are you trying to tell me, Luke? Isn't it obvious? I'm trying to tell you, Jesus is Jehovah, the God of Zechariah, who comes to the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah saw the blessed feet of Jesus in his glorified, resurrected, physical body.